From Hollywood, it's time now for Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. Is this Mr. Dollar, the insurance gentleman? That's right. Well, this is Captain Lyle Woodstock. I was given a message that you had uh, telephoned. Yes, I did. Your insurance company wanted me to look into this trouble with your wife. I wonder when I could see you. At your convenience. But it's not trouble yet. It's quite possible that nothing is wrong at all. Oh? I understood you were worried about her disappearance, that you hadn't heard from her in over a week. Isn't that it? Yes, but, uh, well, I'll explain it all to you. But as I said, in spite of her absence, it's entirely possible that nothing is wrong at all. All right, Captain Woodstock. I'll be out to talk with you this afternoon. Edmund O'Brien in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Washingtonian Life Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Celia Woodstock matter. Expense account item one, $25.50, car rental and mileage to the Woodstock home off the highway just east of Bridgeport. There was a large frame house shuttered against the cold. Icy landscaping swept down to the shore where an empty dock stood against the winter wind blowing across Long Island Sound. Captain Lyle Woodstock, please. Yes, uh, you are Mr. Dollar? That's right. Uh, come inside. Thanks. I am Captain Woodstock. Nice of you to come out. Nasty wind, isn't it? Well, it wasn't blowing like this in Hartford. Quite often windy here in the Sound. I'm afraid you'll have to leave your coat here. Ah, that's fine. I discharged the servants, all of them. Huh? Couldn't stomach their attitudes in Celia's departure. Come along. We'll talk in the library. How did you happen to turn to your insurance company, Mr. Woodstock? Yes, it would seem unusual, wouldn't it? It seems unusual that they would bother with it, unless they thought she'd met with bodily harm. But you told me you don't think so. Yeah, after you, Mr. Dollar. Thanks. I'm afraid I was guilty of a certain amount of deception when I spoke to Mr. Uh... Uh, at the Washingtonian Company? Miller, Sam Miller. Yes, Mr. Miller. Through a delicate choice of words, I'm afraid I intimated that I was frightened for Celia's very life. Sit down. Why the deception? Well, naturally, to interest them in the situation and uh, with a purpose, Mr. Dollar. Couldn't you afford uh, to hire a private detective? My good man, I've wasted a considerable amount of money doing just that. It was from the stumbling idiot that I received the news of Celia's disappearance. He was following her? He had been for a month until he lost her. I'd entertained certain suspicions about Celia. What's this investigator's name? Slater. Mr. David Slater. He was recommended as the best in Bridgeport. Considering his dismal failure, uh, you surely understand why I felt it necessary to turn to someone else. My insurance company struck me as a wise choice, since there's a large policy on her life. All right. I'll talk to this later. Now, will you give me everything you can on your wife? Description, so on? Yes, uh, they're on the table. I brought out a few photos. Hmm. Brunette. Yeah. How old? 27. Yeah, that one uh, was snapped on Doctor's Cave Beach on Jamaica. Striking woman, isn't she? Yeah. Uh, this one was taken while we were anchored off Hilo last summer. You get around. Travel has its advantages, Mr. Dollar. Your boat? Yes, 64-foot schooner in dry dock at the moment. As a matter of fact, I met Celia because on an impulse, I put into Pia Della Cuesta instead of Acapulco. And it seemed that she, too, wanted to travel. Where do you think she's traveling now? Well, I haven't the faintest idea. I started to tell you I'd been troubled by a certain suspicion. She was in seeing entirely too much of a young doctor in Bridgeport. His name is Masterson, Dr. Charles Masterson. You think he could have had something to do with her disappearance? Is that what you mean? No, I shouldn't like to say. I believe that she is a quite perfect physical specimen, uh, yet she visited this doctor fellow at least three times a week. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Yeah, as a matter of fact, yes. We were in Acapulco two years ago. Mm -hmm. I 
The rest of the story wasn't too far from typical, although I don't meet too many of the breed. A, the 55-year-old Woodstock, captain because he owned and gave orders on a schooner, had dedicated his life to what he called adventure. And B, the 27-year-old Celia had also dedicated her life to what she called adventure. The results were a number of voyages, and finally, Celia Woodstock's disappearance. Except for the doctor, I didn't learn what had gone on between. I found the private investigator, David Slater, in a conservatively crummy suite of offices on Front Street in Bridgeport. Well, you've met him, too. You know what type he is. Yes, I followed his wife. How did she do? I've got a report on every move she made for a month. You want to see it? No, not if you remember the highlights. What about this Dr. Charles Masterson? Doctors are hard to pin down, you know that. She went to his office three times a week, but never met him any place else. Maybe she was sick. Her husband says no. Well, I didn't find out. I couldn't have talked to the doctor without letting out who I was. He had a nurse who quit the day before I left the case. You didn't talk to her? I was going to, but after I left, I didn't. Why should I? Do you know who she is, where I can find her? Yeah. Her name is Janet Squire. She went to work in a Red Cross blood collection center up on Union. Mm, good, thanks. Now, what about the day she dropped out of sight? Was there anything special? Sure, there was something special. I wouldn't have lost her. I'm no rookie in this business. She bought a ticket to New York City on the 345. So did I. I got in the same car she did. I didn't see her, but I figured she was powdering her nose or something. Then when she didn't show before the train left, I went through the rest of the cars. But I never picked her up after that. She knew you were tailing her, huh? She must have. Must have got on the car and then right off. That and the money she drew out of the bank makes me think she was running out on old Woodstock and nothing else. No money was mentioned to me. That's funny. Woodstock knew about it. $2,000 the morning she left. Hmm. I wonder what else the old renegade is holding out on me. The phone call she made? No, oh, you didn't say anything about any phone calls? Well, she made quite a few from public booths. I finally got into one next to her. I couldn't get the number, but she talked to somebody named Spray. Didn't say much but the name and then asked, where do you want me to meet you? When she was answered, she said, all right, I'll let you know when everything is arranged. And that's all. Well, that's enough for me. If he thinks he's got a free wife chaser in me, he's mistaken. You going to drop it? Sure, if that's the way it is. I gave up that kind of work a long time ago. I don't like it. Dollar cap. Close the door. What's this? Where's Woodstock? Close the door. If you do anything else, I'll kill you. What's happened? Who are you? Stay away from me. I smell cordite. You fired a gun. Where's Woodstock? He's gone. You come this way now. Move down the hallway. Why? I'll kill you if you don't. Came in here. Now you've got to do what I tell you or I'll kill you. I'll have to. Come on. You better turn around and look at me. Walk backwards. You don't even know who I am. You're in trouble. Maybe I can help Never you. Never mind that. Hop now. Turn around again. Open the door and get in the closet. Now, wait a minute. Please, mister. Please do what I tell you. It won't make any difference if I kill you. Maybe I'd have more of a chance if I did. But I, I won't if you don't make me. Okay. Now, close the door. I heard him open and close some nearby doors, and shortly after that, the front door closed. Then I started kicking my way out. The paneling was heavy, and it cost a torn trouser leg and a scraped shin before I made it. Mrs. Woodstock? Mrs. Woodstock? Oh. He'd given himself some more time by pulling out the phone wires, but it took less than five minutes for me to cover some 200 yards to the nearest neighbor, explain myself, and get through to the Bridgeport police. 
A short time after that, I met Homicide Lieutenant Al Jester and with him watched two ambulance attendants start Mrs. Woodstock toward the hospital. Now, what's the condition, boys? Can you tell? It's bad, Lieutenant. Her right lung. No chance of a statement? Yeah, we'll do what we can, Lieutenant. Well, I guess it depends on her how hard or easy this thing is going to be. Yeah, but better not count on him. I've been disappointed too often. Now, what else did Slater tell you? Oh, that's about all. She'd drawn $2,000 the day he lost her on the train. He said he'd heard her talking on the phone to somebody named Sprague about where to meet him and about some arrangements of some kind. Now, what about Slater? Is he clean? Well, if he isn't, he's careful and he stays out of trouble. I guess the worst thing I can say about him is that he does a lot of divorce snooping. Why? I just wondered... I had no reason not to believe his story. He said as far as he was concerned, the girl was running out on her husband. The more I saw of it, the more it looked that way to me, too. And I came out here to drop the case, and it blew up in my face. The man he described, uh, could he have been this spring? Well, he could have. I didn't ask him. He was half crazy. If he was spraying and I'd thrown the name at him, I'm afraid he'd have killed me. He was that bad. Can you describe the gun? Yeah. Cheap revolver, nickel-plated, short barrel. 32 caliber. You sure of that? Well, I guess a smart lawyer could keep me from swearing it was a 32, but it was. I'll take that. I got only one definite thing out of him. He said Woodstock was gone. That's all he'd say. Then he put me in the closet. I didn't hear him drive away. I was kicking up some noise getting through that door. But the people in the house where I phoned said they saw it leave. The next house that way. Oh, Sergeant. Yeah, Lieutenant? Next house towards town. People saw a car leave. Send a man over and get what you can on it, will you? Yeah, all right. They didn't hear any shooting. You didn't see a car when you got here? No, it must have been parked on the other side of the house. And then I'll get it roped off. Yeah. Snow ought to hold some good prints off the tires. Uh, did I get the amount of the insurance on the victim right? $100,000? Lieutenant Jester. Yeah? You better go upstairs. They were shooting up there, too. Oh, where? Uh, in the hallway toward the back. Garrett says there's a man lying sort of half into a room, but there's no question about it. This one, he's dead. Turn you to the second act of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Have you heard the new Sing It Again, the new comedy with Jan Murray as your host on the Coast to Coast phone? The new cash prizes for cracking the mystery of Sing It Again Phantom Voice. The new speed and color of the tuneful little riddle songs that make Sing It Again a Saturday night must for radio listening. Be listening for Sing It Again tonight on most of these same CBS stations. Now with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we return you to the second act of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. It's a little gloomy, Lieutenant, but I I don't want to handle any of the light switches. Right back there. Oh, yeah. I see. Woodstock. Let me see. Huh? So it is. And get some light on in the room. The shutters are all closed. Push the switch for something that won't hurt Prince. Yes, sir. Clark, you ought to do it. Shot from behind. Here's a gun on the floor, Lieutenant. And that guy told you Woodstock had gone, darling. He couldn't have been more right, could he? Oh, I guess not. Well, let's get out of here until the photographers show up. Neither the photographers nor the fingerprint men nor a thorough search of the house resulted in any progress. By the end of that first day, the description of the man I tangled with had been broadcast along with a possible description of the car he was driving. The police had also put out a futile search on the single name Sprague. And Celia Woodstock hadn't died, but she hadn't regained consciousness either or shown any signs of recovery. I took a hotel room in Bridgeport that night where I'd be called if and when anything happened. Nothing did. The next morning, I went to the Red Cross Blood Collection Center to talk with a nurse who had recently resigned the office of Celia Woodstock's friend and or doctor. I'd come in with my mind tossing motives for murder around, motives of personal greed and selfishness and hate. And it was almost a shock to suddenly face a segment of this country, citizens... Old ones, young ones, men and women, quietly going about the business of helping the best way they knew how. 
I stayed to give my own blood after Janet Squire talked with me. And I knew it would go overseas in the best of company. We can go in here, Mr. Dow. Thank you. I'm sorry to bother you, Miss Squire, but I was told that you were in Dr. Charles Masterson's office until a short time ago. Yes, that's right. Have you seen the morning papers? No. Why do you ask? Mrs. Lyle Woodstock was shot last evening. Mrs. Woodstock? Mm. Well, she's one of Dr. Masterson's patients. Was she uh, seriously injured? They don't know if she'll live. Her husband was killed at the same time. How dreadful. What happened? I don't know. I'm working with the police on it. I'd like to learn as much as I can about Mrs. Woodstock. Well, I'm afraid I know very little. She was a patient, but other than that, I know nothing. Her husband seemed to have the idea that she might be more than just a patient. That there might have been romantic interest between them. Uh-huh. Was there? Well, not that I know of. I make it a point to do very little prying into other people's affairs, Mr. Dollar. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I wish I could. Do you know anything about anyone named Sprague? Sprague? No, I'm afraid I don't. I'm sorry. So am I. I, uh, I hope the results are better when you start working on me. <laughs> I am sorry, Mr. Dollar. If you'll step right through there, Miss File will take care of you. <laughs> A telephone check with Lieutenant Jester about an hour later added nothing. He'd been in communication with Mexican authorities, but they were unable to come up with any leads on Celia Woodstock or even proof that she'd been in the Acapulco vicinity two years ago when Woodstock had told me he'd married her. Homicide men were searching the captain's schooner, and they were still working on the name Sprague. I played my last card and went to see Dr. Masterson. I read about it. Magic. But, Mr. Dollar, I'm sure you realize why my name mustn't be dragged into it. It won't be if it doesn't belong there, Doctor. Why, there was absolutely no basis for his suspicions. Whatever made him say anything like that? He had a detective following her. He had an idea she came to your office too often. Then why didn't he talk to her? He did. He said something about a sinus condition and heat treatment. That's precisely the truth. I resent your attitude, Mr. Dollar. That puts us on a par. Your attitude doesn't set so well with me. Keeping your name out of this case isn't as important as clearing it up, no matter what you think. But I know nothing about it. You must have talked to the woman. As often as she was here, you must have become fairly well acquainted. Mm, no better acquainted than with most of my patients. Well, I don't ask for any more. What did she talk about? Why, the conversations were unimportant. She talked about her travels. They'd come here from Florida to have some work done on their yacht. She talk about her husband? Yes, occasionally. General thing. Like what? I realized that he was much older than she was, but that she was quite satisfied with their marriage and their life together. That's what makes his suspicions of me so ridiculous. She was happy with him. Never anything about unhappiness, about leaving him? No, they were planning on a trip to South America in a few months. Dr. Masterson, did she ever mention anyone named Sprague? Sprague? Yeah, Sprague. I... This is one of the strangest things that's happened to me in a long time. Why? She went to pieces because of that name. Completely and helplessly to pieces. Just before she stopped coming for treatment. What happened? The last visit she made. The afternoon about a week ago. Someone telephoned and asked for a Mrs. Emil Sprague. My nurse and receptionist called in and asked if Mrs. Sprague could answer the phone. Was the nurse Miss Squire? No, no, she just left me. It was Miss Hall, who didn't know my patients by name. But when Mrs. Woodstock heard the name Sprague, she went into hysterics. I gave her a sedative. When she was calmed, I wanted to ask her about what had happened. But, well, I didn't. There was something about her that begged me not to. I decided to wait until she came back. But uh, she never did. Well, it's Amos Sprague now. I'm uh, sorry I was hesitant, Mr. Dollar. Well, it's in the works now. We'll see what we can make out of it. How's Mrs. Woodstock? Still alive. Her chest wounds are bad, though. Well, here's how the shooting stacks up so far. She was wounded by 38 caliber slugs. Her husband was killed by 32s. So if you were right on your gun description, the man you ran into killed the husband. What does that leave? Woodstock killing his wife? He was shot from behind while he was going into the upstairs room. Badly chased up there. 
He had a gun in his hand, and he dropped when he was hit. That was the gun we found on the floor. Thirty-eight caliber. Ballistics hasn't run any comparison tests yet? No. And I won't buy the theory. Mr. and Mrs. Woodstock seem to have been pretty happy. What about their schooner? Well, I talked to my men on the phone. Nothing yet. Crewmen are all available and with alibis. But what's all that got to do with somebody named Mrs. Emil Sprague? I couldn't answer him. Nobody could. But close to 12 that night, the lieutenant phoned me that Mrs. Woodstock was finally responding to treatment and would likely live. I was at the hospital at 12.30, but it wasn't until almost 3 that Lieutenant Jester and I were told that she was conscious and able to answer some questions. Woodstock. Feeling better? Oh. Uh, my name is Lieutenant Jester. This is Mr. Dollar. Hello, Mrs. Woodstock. We're, uh, we're both interested in what happened at your house the other evening. Mrs. Woodstock, do you understand what we're saying to you? Oh, do you understand? My husband. My husband smiled. They told me he was all right. Is he? Yes, Mrs. Woodstock. He was shot. They tell you that? Yes. You know who did it? Yes, I know. I was there. I remember. We wish you'd tell us, Mrs. Woodstock. Emil Sprague? Yes. Yes, Emil. No one else was there. He made me go. Made you go where? To my house. To talk to my husband. Emil Sprague made you go? Why? How could he make you go? Because I'm Mrs. Amos. You are Mrs. Amos, please? Yes. And I hate him. But you were married to Mr. Woodstock. I shouldn't have. I think I understand. You were married to Sprague. Your marriage to him was never ended, but you married Woodstock anyway. Yes. I was wrong. I lied. I didn't tell him. And then it was money. He wanted money. Sprague. Yes. I didn't know where he was. Mexico. I had to get away. And I married my husband. That's all that matters. I'm afraid it isn't. Sprague followed you here. From Florida. I begged him not to. The $2,000 you drew from your bank? I gave it to him. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't enough. He made me stay with him. And made me go with him for some more money. And my husband. I tried to make him understand, and he wouldn't. He blamed me and called me things. He went to the drawer. Oh, why didn't he shoot Emil instead of me? Are you sure of that? Woodstock shot you? Going to the drawer. I remember. Turning around with a gun. And that's all. Do you know where Sprague would go? What happened? Why did he... What is my husband saying? He hasn't said anything. Evidently, Sprague chased him upstairs, shot him there, and left. Do you know where he'd go? Back to Florida. No, we don't think so. We've got a good description of him and the car he was driving. You think he's still in Bridgeport someplace? You said you were with him. Where? He had a room on Commercial Street, 713. Rooming house? No, it's a big building. Uh, apartments. Now, which one is Sprague? It's, um... Number 12 on the second floor. Do you have a phone in the room? Yes. Pleasant 2132. Well, thank you. Uh, we won't bother you anymore. <laughs> thank you, Mrs. Woodstock. I want to help my husband. I'll do anything I can. I want him to know that. Well, we'll tell him, Mrs. Uh, Woodstock. It's a little after three. Roger's trucks are going to be rolling on Commercial Street before long. Think Sprague will give us trouble? Yeah. yeah. If he's been holed up since the shooting, I think he's probably farther off as not the one I saw him. We might slip on him this time of the morning. I'll get some men started out there. You better come with me. Mm, sure. I'll need you to identify. Lieutenant, men should be set in the back of the building. All right, Sergeant. You'll go in with me. Well, Donald and I took a look at the floor. It's that corner one up there. 
There's a door to another room right across from here, so we want to keep him from firing if we can. We didn't want anybody because we want to keep it quiet. I hope it stays that way. All right, Sergeant. Let's go across. Good luck. Lieutenant, the window, he's onto it. We'd better go on across. He's onto it. He's been watching at the window. I, I saw him move. Oh, the devil. Well, you better see what you can do on the phone then, Dollar. The phone? We thought if you couldn't catch him off guard, we'd try and talk him out. There's a pay phone in the hallway. His room's just to the right at the top of the stairs there. That phone's right in line from up there. And yeah, we'll cover him. Okay, Dollar, if you're ready. something with it. Hello? Hello, Sprague? Yeah? We just got a complete statement from Mrs. Woodstock. You're blackmailed the works. She... she she's alive? Yeah, and she's gonna make it. I thought she was dead. I saw her fall. I, I, I killed him because I thought she was dead. If I'd known, I, I wouldn't have killed him. I should have found out. You should have done a lot of things. What we want you to do right now is to give yourself up without any trouble. Every door in the building is covered by police. You won't get out if you try. We want you to come out of your room and down the stairs with your hands out where we can see them. You understand that? Are you listening to me? Come on, Sprague. Come on out and make Stairs, it... Stairs, look out! Get down, darling! Stay there, Sergeant! It's all right. Sprague? Ah. He's dead, Lieutenant. Sergeant. Yes, sir? I'll go phone in. Keep the people away as best you can. Okay. Expense account item two, $45, miscellaneous, hotel, meals, etc., Expense account total, $73.60. Remarks? I understand the lawyers for the Woodstock estate are already measuring ways and means to cut the bigamous wife out of the estate. I don't think the Washingtonian company has a chance of doing the same with the insurance money. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and is written by Gil Dowd with music by Wilbur Hatch. Edmund O'Brien's latest picture is a Paramount Picture production, The Redhead and the Cowboy. Featured in tonight's cast were Francis X. Bushman, Jim Nusser, Ted Osborne, Lorraine Tuttle, Bill Johnstone, Tudor Owen, and Ray Hartman. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. This is Dick Cutting inviting you to join us next week at this time when Edmund O'Brien returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. There's a very charming, very amusing young couple to be found at CBS, the star's address, every Saturday evening. And you're invited to stop by and call on them. They're Liz and George Cooper... And Liz is played by the lovely red-haired Hollywood comedian, Lucille Ball. Liz is nice and easygoing. When trouble's ahead, Liz goes for it easily. It's wonderfully hilarious. It's my favorite husband starring Lucille Ball every Saturday evening on most of these same CBS stations. Stay tuned now for Von Monroe's Caravan, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, where you laugh at Jack Benny every Sunday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>